All right. Uh, okay, welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's 4 uh, p.m. here in Warsaw, at least. Mm, and welcome to another uh, Warsaw University Astronomical Observatory um, Tuesday seminar uh, series. Uh, today, uh, we have an honor to host um, Alessandro Sozetti from Torino. Um, he is a long-term member of the uh, Gaia Consortium, and he's been working on on actually astrometric micro, astrometric planetary detections um, with um, since the very beginnings um, of his scientific career, uh, he, he's uh, studied in Torino and then in the US and now he's back in Torino and working on Gaia um, for, for a long time. And he's going to tell us about Gaia revolution in the topic of exoplanetary science. Alessandro, please. Well, thanks, Lukas. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, what's about to come. Uh, it has been coming for a long time, and we are really finally getting very close to uh, delivering uh, very important results in the exoplanet arena with uh, uh, absolute astrometry with Gaia. Uh, to give you a, a brief introduction to uh, the issues that I will be uh, talk, touching uh, in my talk, uh, let's start with a, a classic recap of the situation in, over the last 25 plus years of uh, uh, planetary uh, mass companions detections in, uh, um, uh, with a variety of techniques. In a diagram, uh, planetary mass versus orbital period, you see here uh, the variety of uh, companions that have been uncovered uh, by, uh, as I said, a variety of techniques uh, that show here their intrinsic biases. Uh, for example, uh, planetary transits uh, that are typically favoring very close in uh, companion being detected uh, thanks to the specific orbital geometry of uh, uh, that is sufficiently favorably aligned with the line of sight uh, for a detection of eclipses. Uh, while uh, the other very successful method, the radar velocity method, uh, Doppler technique, uh, typically has populated uh, all the way up to uh, at least a couple of uh, astronomical units, let's say probably close to now five astronomical units uh, in terms of orbital separation from uh, the sun. In the big list of uh, successful, more or less successful methods for um, uh, detecting a planetary companion, uh, also, astrometry is uh, supposedly uh, uh, shown with a um, gray symbol. And uh, hard as you may uh, try to look, uh, you will not be able to spot a single truly confirmed uh, planetary mass companion detected with this technique. And uh, the uh, issue is uh, something that I will be touching upon in a, in a minute. Uh, but first, let's uh, see briefly what are the classes of objects that we are uh, dealing with uh, as uh, being kind of categorized uh, by uh, people working in the field uh, over the last couple of decades. Uh, the first class that we encounter is a class of hot and warm Jupiters. Uh, these are um, typically uh, Jupiter mass objects, a little bit less or a little bit more, bracketing the, um, the mass of our, of our giant planet in the solar system, but sitting at very close in uh, orbital distances, uh, typically of order of a few days up to tens of days. Uh, the cold Jupiter analogs, uh, these are uh, objects on orbital separations either get increasingly closer to uh, that of our um, own Jupiter in the solar system. Other ones that, are, as I said, have been primarily uh, detected by um, uh, the Doppler method. Then going down in mass and remaining at uh, relatively short orbital distances, uh, we have the so-called hot and warm Neptunes. Uh, these uh, are objects in, with masses in between approximately um, 10 and uh, 50 uh, Earth masses or so. And the last two are the super Earths uh, with an approximate mass range between one and 10 uh, Earth masses. And uh, uh, truly rocky planets, these are objects with the masses very, very close in mass to, uh, to that of uh, the Earth, of, of order of a few uh, Earth masses or, or, or at most. Uh, some of these categories uh, that I have identified here uh, are not seen in our solar system. Uh, we do not have super Earths. 
and uh, the uh, giant planetary mass companions sit on very wide orbits uh, compared to the uh, very close in um, orbital distances that are actually shown in this diagram. Um, this uh, tells you the relevant story about the variety and diversity of uh, possible realizations of extrasolar planetary systems that uh, is now understood because we have uh, a, an important database uh, to play with in terms of uh, understanding and interpretation of, of the results. Uh, the, uh, the number count today is on the order of more than 4,000 uh, planets known orbiting other stars. And that's what makes the bulk of uh, the uh, present day investigations uh, so effective. Uh, we will see uh, towards the end of uh, this um, brief outline that uh, the power of Gaia, in fact, uh, will match these numbers, if not even more. As you uh, see from this diagram, this is the concluding remark that I wanted to give you in, in a broad sense on planetary science. Uh, some of the uh, uh, architectural properties of our uh, solar system are still hard to pick. Uh, we are marginally uh, touching with the radar velocity technique, uh, masses and orbital distances of uh, identical to the one of our uh, Jupiter and uh, Saturn is definitely still uh, out of reach, simply because of the lack of sufficient baseline in the, um, in the uh, survey programs. And the Earth sits there in an area of the parameter space that is, as you can see, entirely depopulated. Uh, there is still a long way ahead for us to uh, reach uh, down there. I mentioned astrometry does not show any uh, specific results in that diagram that I have uh, just shown you. Uh, astrometry is a very desirable technique to have uh, at hand uh, with sufficient sensitivity to planets. Um, it has the, the capability uh, as because it measures the uh, orbital displacement uh, uh, in the plane of the sky of the star perturbed by a nearby uh, companion to actually measure the full orbital arrangement. Um, and uh, thereby, for example, uh, getting rid of the uh, limitations of the Doppler method that uh, is not sensitive to the full uh, orbital architecture of a, of a planetary system because of the intrinsically one-dimensional measurement that it, that it makes, uh, thereby, for example, uh, not being able to identify which is the inclination angle of the orbital plane. This is something that astrometry can do. And in multiple planet systems, it allows you to uh, actually measure the relative inclination angles and the uh, potential uh, degree of uh, mutual alignment or disalignment of uh, pairs of planetary orbits. Um, because of this uh, uh, benefit, it can also give an, uh, an estimate of the actual um, uh, star mass of the, of the central star mass. It will also deliver to you uh, a true estimate of the companion mass. There are difficulties in doing astrometry in the sense that, for example, for the radio velocity method, uh, this is a first order effect. Uh, there is a constant uh, radio velocity uh, barycentric motion uh, from uh, a given star with respect to uh, our sun. Um, but on top of that, um, there is nothing else. Uh, there is only, if there is there, uh, effects due to orbital motion. In the case of astrometry, before you detect orbital motion, you have to first account for the uh, displacement in the, um, on, the, on the celestial sphere, apparent displacement on the celestial sphere due to uh, the stellar proper motion and the parallax effect. And so uh, there is an intrinsic uh, uh, higher order difficulty in, in detecting uh, orbital motion effects in, in astrometry because you first have to deal uh, with other sources of uh, intrinsic stellar motion. And the uh, major issue that uh, astrometry has encountered uh, thus far is the fact that regardless of the difficulty of getting higher order effects uh, to be detected, the magnitude of such effects is really small. Uh, this diagram shows you the, uh, the intrinsic uh, one milliac second, uh, let's say state of the art uh, precision in, um, in astrometric measurements uh, set by the Parkes mission in the 90s. And as you can see from this di diagram that essentially it only scratches the surface of the population of um, uh, signals in astrometry produced by planetary mass companions. So we have to do much better than that. 
this is not an easy task. Uh, this is something that already radar velocity uh, techniques have had to face, uh, moving from the kilometers per second precision down uh, three orders of magnitude uh, again uh, to the meter per second level, which is today the state of the art. And astrometry has to do the same, uh, improving by at least two orders of magnitude. Uh, with respect to the millisecond level uh, Ipacos uh, precision. Uh, we need uh, Gaia, and this is really the answer to, uh, uh, to the conundrum. Gaia is promising and is uh, now uh, all the more uh, beginning to um, uh, deliver on the um, possibility of getting 10 microsecond level uh, space astrometry. Gaia delivers uh, observations in, on for the full sky, uh, essentially scanning it in a way uh, similar to what was done by the uh, Ipacos mission. Uh, you see this uh, in, the, in the diagram on the left. Uh, it has uh, three different specific uh, motions of the satellite um, that allow uh, an efficient scanning of the full celestial sphere in six months. This uh, uh, sky coverage is uh, highly uh, inhomogeneous so that as you can see in the, in the bottom left uh, figure, uh, you have an average of approximately 70 observations in, during the five year, which is the uh, initially defined nominal mission lifetime. There are regions in the sky in which you only get uh, over five years, uh, just a few tens, and uh, some regions of the sky that deliver actually a couple of hundreds. Regardless of these uh, uh, specifications, uh, we really are going to uh, see Gaia uh, improving by two orders of magnitude with respect to the uh, Epacos mission level uh, astrometric precision. Uh, the uh, fundamental numbers that uh, I want you to bring home are uh, the ones associated to the CCD level individual measurement precision that Gaia can attain. Uh, oftentimes uh, in the literature uh, numbers uh, corresponding to, for example, the end of mission uh, precision on the measurement of the parallax are provided. This number is a little bit misleading because it is not a fundamental measurement, it's a derived parameter that, that, that gets fitted with a specific uh, level of quality. Uh, to uh, optimize uh, the chances of uh, detecting planetary motion, you have to do the best you can in terms of single measurement precision. And here I show you uh, the estimate before uh, um, uh, mission entered into uh, full um, uh, space science uh, operations mode, uh, provided in terms of uh, expected precision uh, at, a, at for one CCD. Remember that there are nine in the in the uh, Gaia focal plane. It's a function of the magnitude of the target. Um, the uh, the fundamental message to bring home is that Gaia delivers for bright stars. Uh, on the order of maybe 50 microsecond precision on a single CCD. There's nine of them. And so over a single transit um, from one of the Gaia uh, fields of view, there are two of them in, on, on board the spacecraft, you may obtain an integrated uh, close to maybe 20 to 30 microsecond precision. And this is a number that is uh, fundamental to uh, retain in the um, uh, coming discussion. Gaia has delivered already twice intermediate uh, catalogs of data. Uh, here you see a summary of the outcome uh, in terms of precision of the parallax parameter as a function of magnitude of the target for the first Gaia data release, Gaia DR1, and the second Gaia data release, Gaia DR2, compared to uh, the expectations uh, for the end of mission uh, final uh, analysis of five years. Uh, you see that Gaia has uh, gained between Gaia DR1 and DR2 uh, very much. Uh, there are still issues uh, that uh, we will see have been uh, somewhat taken into account and improved with the third Gaia that release, which I will only touch briefly upon uh, at the end of the discussion. But uh, the fundamental point to, uh, to, to bring home in this case is the fact that uh, in the very bright star regime for magnitudes uh, brighter than 13 or so, Gaia is still uh, somewhat limited uh, to some extent um, uh, by uh, calibration issues such that the data uh, do not yet have 
the intrinsic single measurement uh, precision level that is required for uh, very, very efficient groundbreaking uh, science in the exoplanet um, arena. Nevertheless, um, something has been done uh, already at the level of DIA2 uh, for uh, as far as uh, investigations of uh, exoplanets uh, are concerned, even though uh, at the level of DIA2 especially, the wealth of data uh, was uh, only related to um, uh, single star information. Uh, the uh, astrometric solutions reported for Gaia DR2 uh, only contain information on position, personal promotion, and parallaxes, and there is no a priori um, uh, information on binarity. Nevertheless, uh, we have done something already uh, rather relevant in the, in the field of exoplanets with Gaia DR2 data. The first uh, important uh, contribution of Gaia um, uh, DR2 uh, to the field of exoplanets was the measurement of very accurate distances to all the targets known to be planet hosts. In this case, I show uh, the results uh, for uh, the sample of transiting extrasolar planets. To measure accurately the radius of, of, your, of your transiting planet, you need to know the size of the star very accurately. And in this case, you see from the, from the two figures on the left and on the right, uh, the result of whether you have at your uh, available a uh, Gaia parallax measurement or not, in terms of uh, improved precision in the measurement of the stellar radius and thereby uh, improved measurement of the planetary radius that is inferred for, um, uh, from the knowledge of the stellar radius. This is the first groundbreaking result that Gaia provided. Uh, before Gaia launch, um, probably on the order of 0.1% of the stars known to have planets had uh, a parallax measurement. And this is uh, really the first fundamental addition. Uh, very accurate, uh, few percent level precision uh, measurements of stellar IDI uh, improve very much uh, the, uh, the precision and accuracy of the measurements of uh, planetary IDI. As far as detection of uh, orbital motion from uh, planetary mass companions, uh, well, uh, there is also something significant that has been delivered by Gaia 2 This is one case, uh, very actually very famous case. Um, HD 114762 is the first planetary mass companion identified by the Doppler technique uh, back in 1989. Uh, you, you probably remember that just two years ago, uh, Didier Mayor and Michel, um, Michel Mayor and Didier Colos were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the first uh, extrasolar planet orbiting a solar type star. The Latham and collaborators announcement uh, six years before uh, the Michel Mayor and Didier Colos announcement uh, actually has not been awarded the Nobel Prize because uh, the minimum mass uh, as it is uh, derived by the Doppler uh, technique. The companion orbiting uh, HD 114762 was 11 Jupiter masses. And it was really suspected to be too high uh, in mass, uh, such that just uh, there were already rather good chances that uh, it, its true mass would be higher than that. Uh, I remind you that the Doppler technique uh, allows only to measure uh, um, a lower limit to the uh, to the mass of, a, of an object because the sign of the inclination is unknown. And so as long as the sign of inclination is, for example, on the order of 30, 40 degrees, you already have a square root two, square root three and more um, higher uh, mass value of, uh, with respect to the minimum mass. Indeed, uh, the analysis of Gaia uh, DR1 and DR2 uh, data has allowed to infer on a statistical basis, and this is the, uh, the first relevant uh, result, uh, that the, uh, the size of the perturbation, uh, probably uh, apparent in the, um, in, the, uh, in the residuals to a single star fit in the Gaia, in the Gaia data, uh, allows for the presence of a very massive object. Uh, with a um, uh, with a uh, mass probably uh, in the ballpark of that of a low mass and dwarf, and so just based on this uh, statistical uh, measurement of the excess noise in the in the in the Gaia catalog for this for this star, without any direct information on binarity, it was possible to infer a much higher mass than than that of a of a, of a planet for HD one one four seven six two b. 
uh, improve constraints on planetary companions have come through another kind of technique uh, that in this case, again, takes advantage uh, of um, uh, proper motion catalogs published uh, to very different epochs. Uh, we're talking in, in particular here, uh, the Iparcos and the Gaia DR2 catalog. They are separated by approximately a time baseline of 25 years. Uh, very long-term proper motion uh, is usually uh, representative, or rather well representative, of the intrinsic barycentric motion of a, of a system. But on a, a short time baseline, uh, it, the uh, actual measurement of the, of the stellar proper motion may, if it is there, be affected by the presence of a companion. And so the actual direction of the proper motion components at the epoch of Hipparchus uh, or the epoch of Gaia uh, will be potentially very different if there is significant uh, orbital motion in the data due to a, a nearby companion. And so the technique of proper motion differences or proper motion anomaly, as it uh, was called by Carvella and collaborators in this case, allows you to effectively uh, infer the presence of a companion uh, because the true proper motion, the true barycentric proper motion of the system uh, can be estimated and the, an estimate of the amount of orbital motion uh, in terms of proper motion difference uh, can be estimated. Uh, applications of this technique have provided rather important results. Uh, classic uh, cases, for example, in this work by Carvalho and collaborators are the investigations of the, let's say, the, the space of parameters or masses and orbital separations that can be inferred by, uh, for example, a no significant detection of a proper motion difference. There is a proper motion uh, difference that is within the error bars. And so there is no uh, significant proper motion um, uh, that is zero within the error bus. There is no significant proper motion detected. You can infer what are the companions that are compatible with this no detection of, of, uh, of uh, proper motion difference between the Gaia and the Parkos epochs. And this was done, for example, in this case, uh, for the uh, system of Proxima Centauri. That's the nearest to us. Uh, more effectively, um, uh, inferences on the actual dynamical mass and orbital separation of the companion have been, uh, have been performed with a proper motion technique, where the proper motion technique uh, has been combined uh, with other um, uh, observational channels. This is the case, for example, of a, a famous uh, young planetary, uh, high mass planet, uh, planetary companion around the young star Beta Pictoris. And here, uh, the uh, most relevant studies uh, have taken advantage of the combination of the uh, proper motion difference or proper motion anomaly, uh, which is statistically, statistically not very significant um, at, the, uh, at the epochs of Gaia and Hipparchus, but push constraints on the magnitude of the, of, the, um, of the proper motion change due to orbital motion. And this combined with inferences from radio velocities and direct imaging, because this is a, a young uh, planetary companion that has actually been observed um, uh, through an actual uh, uh, arc of its orbit around uh, its um, uh, young primary. And this the, the combination of these three techniques, uh, absolute, relative, uh, astrometry, and relative, and radio velocities, has actually allowed to pinpoint more accurately the, uh, the mass and orbital separation of the companion as an orbit uh, with a period of approximately 25 years and a mass just above the 10 Jupiter mass um, uh, value. Getting back to uh, the Proxima Centauri system, uh, there was a recently announcement by uh, in fact, the collaborators in our own group in uh, the Torino Observatory uh, that uh, inferred from the radio velocity uh, var variations the presence of a possible super Earth companion at one and a half AUs from Proxima Centauri. This will be the second companion in the system. Uh, the first was identified a couple of years ago, uh, always through uh, the Doppler technique, uh, to be uh, an Earth mass, minimum mass uh, companion orbiting in the temperance zone of Proxima Centauri. Uh, so this was really a very uh, big highlight because uh, it was a potentially habitable planet, let's say, uh, although this is stretching it a bit, uh, in my opinion, orbiting just the nearest stars to us. Uh, well, the, uh, the possible existence of a second companion uh, identified in, in, uh, in radio velocity data uh, was marginally confirmed using, again, the proper motion anomaly, anomaly uh, approach. Um, in this case, uh, um, you can uh, essentially constrain 
um, uh, five of the seven orbital parameters to the uh, orbit putative orbit of the of the companion candidate from the, from the Doppler technique, and then scan the possible uh, ranges of inclination and the other uh, orbital elements, the uh, longitude of the ascending node uh, that is uh, not measured by uh, radio velocities. And uh, with a uh, proper motion detect the, the difference detected for, um, uh, for Proxima Centauri, it was in fact possible to pinpoint a potential uh, value of the true mass uh, of, the, uh, of the object in the ballpark of uh, maybe the one of a massive super Earth or a, a low mass Neptune mass companion. Uh, again, uh, however, uh, the constraints are relatively uh, lousy because of the, the, the data is still not sufficiently strong to uh, uh, announce a very uh, high confidence detection. And the last uh, relevant um, result that I want to mention briefly uh, on the uh, application of this technique is, uh, in fact, something very recent uh, that was just published again last year. And it applies to uh, a first time uh, very high uh, quality measurement of strong misalignment in a system, uh, in a nearby star system, uh, planetary system, uh, around the near one uh, star that is actually naked eye, uh, Pi Mensa, uh, 50 magnitude or so. Uh, this star has an interesting history because it was detected uh, uh, to have um, a very massive, uh, very eccentric. Um, giant planetary companion many years ago. And very recently, the test mission uh, uncovered a super Earth transiting uh, in a very short period. Uh, by combining uh, radio velocities, uh, the photometric information from, from the test mission and the uh, proper motion uh, difference um, uh, between the Gaia and the Parkos, uh, it was possible for us to uh, actually infer, um, again, the likely uh, inclination and um, uh, longitude of the ascending node of uh, the uh, massive eccentric long period Jupiter, uh, massive Jupiter object. Uh, this uh, made, allowed us to make a clear statement uh, on the possible uh, mutual inclination between the massive Jupiter on the outer orbit and the transiting companion, which we know uh, has an essentially an inclination very close to 90 degrees. Uh, there is one degree of freedom uh, in the sense that we do not know uh, the longitude of the ascending node from the transit technique uh, for uh, uh, the uh, transiting super Earth. But however, we can say that it, at the minimum, the uh, misalignment between the two orbits should be on the order of 50 degrees or so. And this is already a very important contribution to uh, the understanding of the possible architecture and general uh, evolution history, dynamical evolution history in this campaign. Now, uh, it is time to uh, shift gears. Uh, this is what we have learned so far in terms of uh, understanding uh, of uh, the uh, potentialities of um, uh, Gaia DR2 data. Uh, DR3 is about to come. Uh, it is uh, going to uh, be delivered in uh, around the middle of next year. And it will deliver for the first time information, direct information on non-single stars. It will do it through a set of different uh, observational channels. Uh, Gaia does not do only astrometry, it does uh, spectroscopy and it does uh, photometry. So uh, the uh, data products that will be found in the uh, Gaia DR3 catalog in just about a year's time from now, uh, will encompass astrometric binaries, spectroscopic binaries, eclipsing binaries, and there will also uh, be clear uh, uh, detection of uh, resolved binary companions. Uh, let's focus on the way uh, we fit uh, astrometric orbits of planets uh, with Gaia. This is a brief summary of uh, how we see things. Uh, the, uh, the modeling of astrometric orbits will be done in two components. There will be a clear contribution from the stellar motion, uh, intrinsic stellar motion, proper motion and, and, and parallax. And then uh, we will have to model the planetary parameters, uh, and, uh, taking into account the fact that Gaia sensitive uh, scanning direction is intrinsically a one dimensional measurement. And so in the long scan direction, we will have a projection of the time at a given scanning angle. Um, of the uh, orbital motion of the uh, of the companion. 
and the reconstruction of the uh, uh, of the um, uh, different scanning directions across the uh, the set of uh, data available allows you to effectively fit two dimensional objects, although the the uh, the measurements are intrinsically one dimension. That's why uh, it will be possible to actually uh, detect efficiently uh, orbital motion in Gaia data. There is a specific package that takes into account um, uh, all this and focuses on the uh, modeling of astromatic orbits of planetary systems in the Gaia DPAC pipeline, and it does so uh, in uh, with different flavors of the way of uh, astromatic orbits are fitted because we have learned from uh, uh, many lessons for the Doppler technique, for example, that especially when it comes to uh, very complex signals to disentangle, uh, different uh, algorithm recipes uh, for orbit fitting uh, can provide sometimes uh, different results. And so there would be uh, intrinsically to the Gaia uh, pipeline for stromatic orbit fitting uh, a higher order multiplicity of, algor of algorithms that are run uh, to find agreement on the, uh, the way the orbits are computed and measured. So now uh, in the second part of, the, uh, of my um, chat, uh, let's focus briefly on uh, the impact of Gaia in the, uh, in the upcoming uh, uh, data releases. Uh, I want to spend one second uh, on Gaia photometry, but then I'll focus most of the time on Gaia astrometry. Uh, Gaia photometry uh, can, in fact, detect transiting uh, giant planetary uh, mass uh, candidates. Uh, there is, um, let's say, an educated guess uh, done almost 10 years ago in the literature there that uh, quantified the uh, power, but also the limitations of Gaia-specific uh, scanning law to uh, to chart the whole sky that essentially um, uh, makes the detection of uh, something that is not uh, larger than five or six days of period almost impossible, uh, essentially because of the very, very uh, low cadence uh, sampling of um, possible transit events of these objects. Uh, the photometric precision is pretty good. Uh, so this is not a, uh, an issue for the detection of transiting giant planetary uh, clan candidates, uh, but the, uh, the cadence is definitely a big limitation. Uh, the estimates, however, um, prior to launch, we're talking about maybe thousands of uh, transiting hot Jupiters uh, that could be delivered by Gaia. Uh, with a uh, clear uh, peak in the, in the numbers for magnitudes larger than 12, 13 or so. Uh, this has obviously potential repercussions because uh, once you have the radius of an object through the transit technique, you would like to also measure its mass. And confirmation of efforts of the nature of these uh, companions um, through detection of, of, of orbital motion with the Doppler method uh, will be most likely uh, severely limited by uh, target brightness. In uh, uh, just very, very uh, recently, uh, we got uh, confirmation that Gaia actually can deliver this. Uh, this is a Gaia image of the week that's been posted very recently on, uh, on the Gaia website that tells the story of the first detection of a not yet known transiting planet candidate uh, with Gaia data. And in here you see the five, uh, actually the four transit events, just a few points during the transit. Uh, with the Gaia, uh, let's say, low cadence sampling. And um, on, the, on the bottom panel, you, instead you see the face folded uh, uh, transit feature with a period of uh, something like three days or so. This is a typical hot Jupiter identified by uh, Gaia data. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the magnitude of this target is approximately 13 at G magnitude and it is 14 at V band, which is the exactly right on the typical uh, range of, uh, of magnitude of targets that uh, are expected to uh, deliver such results. Now, uh, let's say the last 10, 15 minutes, uh, we should uh, move to the discovery space uh, of Gaia for astrometry because that's where the uh, bulk of the relevant information I want to tell you about in terms of exoplanetary science will, uh, will come. In, uh, again, in a planetary mass uh, with a major diagram, uh, focus your attention on the purple curves. The, um, uh, the two uh, higher up, uh, the ones that are uh, dashed, uh, corresponding to uh, the detection limits 
anything above these curves will be detected by Gaia uh, with some statistical confidence, corresponding to uh, the limits in mass and orbital separation uh, for, let's say, a nearby uh, low mass stars, a couple of tens of parsecs away uh, from the sun, or this is the higher curve, um, a solar mass star, uh, something like 200 parsecs away in one of the nearby star forming regions. Uh, the uh, solid curves are the same um, if you instead uh, then uh, supposing a standard nominal mission of five years, you double the mission lifetime and observe for 10 years. The typical planetary companion to be detected by Gaia would be a giant planet on a few astronomical units of it. That's the fundamental message to bring home. Uh, is this interesting? Uh, and the answer is yes, because uh, Gaia has the capability to be sensitive to planets, potentially uh, orbiting maybe millions of stars, if not tens of millions of stars. And uh, given a very educated guess on the present day understanding of planetary frequencies of such companions, you can infer easily and this has been the subject of many um, uh, studies in the, in, in, over the past uh, 15 years or so, um, that Gaia is then capable of detecting tens of thousands of new giant planets. This is really a big, big number. Uh, it may double, only Gaia may more than double the uh, number of known planetary companions known today, uh, even with a standard nominal mission lifetime. And, uh, the good news is that Gaia is still running uh, in six and a half years after the, the, the start of mission operations. Uh, it has been officially extended until uh, uh, almost eight years, almost officially, let's say. We still need confirmation, but we're almost getting there. And uh, uh, there is fuel to run for 10 years. And the expectation is really that Gaia will really indeed double the mission lifetime. So the fundamental legacy of the, of the mission uh, for exoplanetary science will really be uh, the understanding of the uh, details of the structure of uh, orbital parameters, distributions, uh, frequencies, and uh, uh, how these uh, distributions correlate with the properties of the, uh, of the stellar hosts, uh, be they age, uh, masses, uh, metallicity, and so forth. This will really def be the fundamental contribution from Gaia. Uh, this is a quick reminder of how much we could gain if we double the mission lifetime, uh, the numbers in, term, on, in terms of uh, detectable giant planets uh, up to uh, essentially the period of, of our own Jupiter uh, will more than triple. This is really a spectacular uh, result expected now. We said the Dapitol uh, uh, zone, very low mass companions clearly are not uh, within the realm of uh, Gaia capabilities. Uh, this is a, a clear um, uh, way of uh, seeing this. The signal of the Earth at 10 parsec around the Sun is a fraction of a milliard second. And even the nearest stars to us, uh, low mass uh, and dwarfs orbiting, uh, with orbiting um, habitable zone, very low mass companions, uh, still do not wobble with detectable uh, signals uh, for Gaia. The, we are still in the ballpark of the micro second level signals that are definitely way below a factor of 20 or so, the best that Gaia can do. But as I said, uh, even tens of thousands of giant planetary companions will deliver great information. Uh, this is, for example, a, a standard way of seeing it. Um, there is a known uh, trend of planet, uh, giant planet frequency with increasing uh, stellar mass and increasing uh, um, uh, stellar metallicity that has been known since now uh, the very beginning of the, of the study of extrasolar planets. And usually uh, with just the numbers that we have today, you end up studying these diagrams, uh, correlation diagrams with uh, of order of 50 to 100 stars in a bin. And uh, what Gaia will do for you will be to populate uh, every bin uh, by a couple of orders of magnitude more targets. And this is exactly what I mean when in, in terms of studying the fine structure of these distributions and trends. Another uh, spectacular set of, um, uh, of impacts uh, of Gaia, I will now list briefly here. Uh, one is uh, young stars. There's maybe a thousand or so young stars within a couple of hundred uh, parsecs from the sun. Uh, and uh, Gaia will typically uh, see 
very massive uh, companions orbiting these stars, uh, and most likely uh, the ones that are really straddling the, the threshold uh, between uh, what we call planets and what we call brown dwarfs. This threshold in, uh, in, in mass it, uh, occurs at 13 Jupiter masses. And so we will get for, for Gaia a unique opportunity to explore the giant planet brown dwarf transition region uh, to understand really how frequency changes as a function of, of planetary mass. In a regime of orbital separations, as I said, uh, typically uh, some astronomical units, not many, uh, that is uh, almost entirely uh, impossible for nowadays instrumentation that attempts to di detect, directly detect them. Uh, another couple of uh, relevant uh, additions uh, to uh, knowledge in planetary science from Gaia will come from uh, even niches of possible uh, detections. Uh, there's a chance for Gaia to maybe uh, be sensitive to uh, orbital motion from giant planets orbiting ultra cold dwarfs. We're talking about uh, uh, objects that are barely burning um, uh, nuclear uh, fusion inside, uh, so they are at the study of the, uh, the regime of brown dwarfs and stars. Uh, Gaia could possibly uh, find planets, if they are there, around maybe uh, on the order of a thousand, a sample of a thousand of such ultra cool dwarfs. And this uh, would be a very first time uh, um, test of plant formation uh, that has never been attempted before. Another very interesting niche of, uh, of for Gaia is the potential to uncover planets orbiting white dwarfs on a regime of separations that is essentially not accessible from any other technique today. Uh, there are um, expectations that uh, within an, a certain interval of orbital separations, there should be no planets at all uh, because they've been blown away by the uh, post main sequence uh, evolution of the, of, the, of the stellar primary. And so if you find planets, or if you do not find planets, this is uh, around white dwarfs, this is a key uh, test of the theories that uh, tell you that uh, there should be no planets, or if they are, uh, then they must have been reprocessed and uh, they have uh, evolved again through a second generation of planet formation processes. Uh, there may be over the, um, a few thousands of uh, white dwarfs for which Gaia is sensitive sufficiently to detect planets. Another category of uh, very interesting results that I expected is the detection of uh, uh, asymmetric detection by Gaia of planets in binary systems. Um, there are uh, several questions that I'm now listing here uh, in connection to uh, possible differences in the planetary population, uh, whether they are orbiting a single star or a star in a binary system. Uh, I will not go into the details, but the fundamental point here to, to bring home is the fact that uh, Gaia is very democratic. And so it will observe uh, stars of all types, and we know that uh, maybe 50% of the, of the stars in, in, in the galaxies uh, have a stellar companion. So uh, one in two stars is a binary, then uh, if Gaia can uh, find planets around maybe a million stars, uh, it will also be sensitive to, in many cases, uh, both uh, uh, planets orbiting either uh, of the component of a stellar binary. And this would be obviously spectacular impact in terms of understanding of uh, uh, differences between stars with planets in uh, binaries or in, in single systems. Last few minutes uh, to uh, briefly go through uh, a set of potential synergies uh, between uh, Gaia data and other detection and characterization, and characterization programs um, uh, in the exoplanet field. Uh, that are just either now uh, already operating or that are about to come online or will, will come in the future. Uh, one thing I'd like to uh, briefly stress is the synergy between uh, Gaia astrometry and radio velocities. Uh, if you set a threshold of uh, something like 30 micro seconds, uh, which is the signal that maybe the lowest signal that we may be able to optimistically measure with Gaia, uh, let's say maybe not for the R3, but in the next, uh, in the next data release in the R4, you uh, come up with a number that maybe 50% of known companions uh, from the detected with other velocities uh, is accessible for detection with astrometry uh, with guy. And uh, for these, it will be possible to estimate directly the true masses and the uh, true orbital arrangement of the, uh, 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 and the architecture potentially in, of multiple systems.
this is a, a very relevant uh, element of synergy between the two techniques uh, that goes actually both ways because new planet detections uh, with Gaia of outer giants uh, may spark uh, radio velocity follow up to find uh, inner companions in the uh, in uh, close in to the stars that are actually obviously escaping uh, the capabilities of Gaia. Uh, there is a broad uh, synergy between Gaia and uh, direct imaging, and we go back again to the issue of uh, uh, very young stars. In this case, uh, the uh, the possibility is to uh, link dynamical mass measurements, um, courses they may be uh, from Gaia, with uh, the uh, identifications of uh, directly imaged companions, uh, for which you usually, uh, from uh, uh, direct imaging techniques, uh, can only infer the mass through modeling. Uh, because you, you hardly see of the motion effects. So it is very hard to infer directly the mass of the companion. Uh, this is usually a model dependent quantity. Uh, but the, uh, the synergy between Gaia and especially the next generation uh, and extreme adaptive optics direct imaging instruments, on the ELTs in particular, uh, will be very, uh, very strong. And the regime of overlap of orbital separations between these two techniques uh, will begin to be significant, uh, thereby allowing uh, Gaia to uh, make significant inferences of many of the directly image uh, objects uh, that may get true mass estimates. To uh, conclude, uh, I'm going slightly off the bounds, but uh, I hope uh, Lucas will allow me. Uh, the possibility of detecting uh, transiting giant planets with Gaia astrometry. This has been estimated in the past in a couple of uh, cases, and the uh, fundamental uh, point to bring home in this case is the fact that Gaia has the capability to uh, measure potentially a, a quasi edge on configuration with an orbit close to 90 degrees, maybe within a few degrees of uncertainty, for maybe hundreds of, of uh, sufficiently, let's say, intermediate separation uh, giant planets. The, uh, the fact that the orbit is compatible with, with being a, a transiting configuration will not be sufficient uh, uh, from the Gaia uh, inferences, but it will provide an interesting sample for follow-up to see if these objects do in fact transit. And this is a population of uh, cold giant planets that Gaia will deliver, potentially transiting. It would be very interesting to follow up in this case um, as an element of synergy with the transit technique so that uh, if even just a few of them are actually captured in, in transit, it will provide very important uh, uh, elements of understanding of this population uh, of objects that the transit technique so far has not been able at all to capture. I will skip this one because it's too late and I will get to the uh, end of the story uh, with a word of caution. Um, we have now uh, delivered a third intermediate data release, early data release three. You see in the left panel, uh, the uh, gain in terms of uh, floor of systematic uncertainties uh, in the single measurement error as a function of uh, magnitude um, from the DR2 level, which is the dotted blue line to the, uh, to the EDR3 level, which is the continuous blue line. Even with this improvement, we are still significantly off from the uh, expected uh, systematic noise floor that should come at the end of the mission. We're probably on the order of still a factor between three and four off. And there is a significant gain to still uh, um, obtain in successive uh, data releases in order to be able to get rid uh, as much as possible of these residual the systematics that are coming from insufficient uh, levels of uh, calibration for the, uh, for the bright star end uh, to really bring down uh, the quality of the measurement errors uh, to the level that is really the one that will allow Gaia to impact. Uh, to a very significant degree the exoplanet field. Um, I stress the point on the very bright stars, uh, particularly because uh, the bright stars are the ones that have the best chances of uh, igniting um, uh, interest in uh, follow-up measurements, uh, be them from radio velocities, transit, imaging, or the likes. Um, uh, very faint uh, planet detections um, for stars 13 magnitude, uh, a G band or fainter, 
uh, will be most available in terms of uh, statistical analysis, but it will be very difficult for any other technique to follow up and improve the knowledge of the, of the architecture of the systems or the, of the physical properties of the systems. Uh, that's why the bright stars and the sample of, of planets that will be found around bright stars is so valuable. And I think I can uh, stop here and um, take any questions on the final uh, summary slide. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro. I'll do the clapping on behalf of everyone. Thank you for this nice lecture. Um, so questions, if you have a question uh, and you're here on Zoom, please raise your Zoom hand so that then I can see and, and let you speak the question. Marius, please. So hello, Alessandro. So for the very nice presentation, hey. I generally want to ask one technical, simple question. For the Doppler effect for the planetary system, yes? It is the most promising when we're looking to the system from the edge. So we, we see that we're most moving, yes? Opposite situation, when we're looking to the uh, astro astrometric displacement due to, yes? The better effect, yes, it is when we're looking from the top or from the bottom to, to, to the system, it doesn't matter, yes? So it is so it is possible that this to do to this two method, yes, it can be like example, uh, astrometric displacement shows very clear, but no uh, Doppler shift or yes, yes, certainly. Yeah, certainly. So do you include some statistical, some synergy or, or something with this, with these two methods? Uh, this is another uh, point that is uh, uh, certainly very interesting to explore. Um, uh, the, um, there is a category of, uh, of companions that will possibly be found by Gaia that uh, go almost entirely undetected by, uh, by the Doppler technique or show up very, very marginally in uh, Doppler data. Uh, precisely because of what you said, uh, there is a low sign of the inclination angle the mass of the companion is actually large, but the sign of inclination is small. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Doppler effect uh, is very, very tiny, uh, maybe meter per second or so. And so uh, unless you have an extremely uh, good knowledge of the fact that the planet is there, you may miss it entirely. And uh, uh, any detection of uh, such companions in Gaia will be very valuable uh, if they come uh, with an orbit measurement that tells you that uh, the inclination angle is close to zero. Uh, because uh, it will be possible to go back and see if, uh, in the, uh, if there is uh, radio velocity measurements in, uh, available and if it is possible to combine these and, and uh, improve the, um, the mass determination and the orbit determination of the companion, even uh, assuming a marginal uh, effect seen in the, in the Doppler technique. Uh, this is certainly going to be done in, uh, in the near future. Uh, it would be something that is most effective uh, when the data uh, of Gaia are actually released in terms of time series. <clears throat> because to do this uh, type of uh, um, synergistic uh, analysis, you really do have to model simultaneously both data sets. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? You mentioned the astrometric time series, and I think everyone is very eagerly waiting for those. Uh, but can you just briefly describe what will be the form of the data to come in in DR four, right? Yes, the next uh, the next data release does not contain. Uh, it will only contain orbital solutions uh, when they would be good, but it will not contain the time series. Uh, the uh, the format will essentially be uh, the one that I showed at the beginning uh, when I was discussing the model of the Gaia. Uh, astrometry of planets, and I go back quickly and I show it here. So uh, the format envisioned for, uh, um, uh, for the time series will be uh, essentially the long scan coordinates uh, that we call the local plane coordinates, which will be the, uh, uh, at, a, at any specific time of observation of Gaia, the projection along the scanning direction of the, um, uh, of the motion of the star. Uh, which will be modeled eventually uh, as a function of orbital proper motion, uh, sorry, of stellar proper motion, parallax, and orbital effects um, projected by the scanning angle uh, along the uh, scanning direction. 
this is expected to be the format of the data that will appear. It's essentially an analog to uh, what was released for uh, the Parkos mission in the, in, uh, back in the 90s. Right. Yeah, I'm wondering, you know, if people want to get ready for the data to come, uh, just to be aware that these are not alpha deltas as a function nope. of time, yep. right? This is a projection, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I have another question. You mentioned um, proper motion anomaly, uh, yeah. which uh, is uh, looks very uh, uh, a very interesting method. But this did this method connected Hipparchus and Gaia. So, do you envisage this method can be also used for Gaia alone, or is it too early now? Or the data is just too short. The time baseline is much shorter between successive data releases. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it would be uh, harder to use effectively. And um, the method essentially will disappear as soon as the time series are out. Uh, already, already now with year three, I expect this to be explored much less uh, because there will already be information from, uh, from orbits. And uh, um, I didn't mention, but the, the orbital solutions that uh, will not be the only thing that gets released from astronomy. So there will also be uh, long-term trends uh, that will be also detected. And so the, the, the non-single star solutions will also encompass what we call acceleration solutions that are essentially fitting uh, derivatives of proper motion. Uh, because we see curvature in the, in the, in, in the stellar motion that is due uh, to a companion. And so uh, once acceleration and orbital solutions are out at the level of the three already, there will be um, already a very significant amount of work uh, to be done by, uh, by by the community to make sense of the of the results, um, uh, with some level of combination uh, of information available from different techniques to not be uh, as effective as combining obviously the two time series, uh, but this will already be much more informative than uh, the uh, the proper motion anomaly technique can can provide. There will still be a niche, uh, and this would be the one uh, that is uh, for which. For example, long-term accelerations are still not detected. The companions have so long a period that you find them with a data proper motion technique, but they do not pop up yet as acceleration solutions because the time baseline of the data uh, used by Guy in this case, three years, less than three years for the three is uh, too, too short. So in this case, uh, I don't rule out that uh, the people will not do proper motion, data proper motion analysis anymore. Um, in the for most likely they will stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions and we are uh, almost rightly on, on, uh, after one hour of the seminar, so not to keep you any longer. Thank you for, uh, for your lecture, Alessandro. Thank you for joining us remotely. Uh, at, at least uh, we could have you this way. Thank you all for joining uh, and we continue the planetary topic over the next seminar. So please join us um, in the next weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Sutras. I look forward to finally visiting Warsaw one of these days. Please. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye bye.